Hello, and welcome back to Beyond Networks, the evolution of living systems. In this module, we've sort of been looking at how can you get new process perspectives on evolution using the tools that we currently have. We've looked at different ways of getting dynamical models that are well uh, formulated and validated for dynamic mechanistic explanation. We've looked at evolvability mainly over the last two lectures in terms of what is the um, sort of interaction between robustness and evolvability, the resolution of that paradox, that apparent paradox, and also the role of uh, modularity and how to define modularity in a genotype phenotype map for evolvability. Today we're going to move to another topic which is really important. So some people think Evo Devo should be centered all around evolvability. Other people think homology is the most important concept in biology. Here's David Wake in a 1994 book review of a book called Homology, edited by uh, Brian Hall. And he writes, homology is the central concept of all biology. Strong statement. Whenever we say that a mammalian hormone is the same as a fish hormone, that a human sequence is the same as a sequence in a chimp or a mouse, that a hox gene is the same in a mouse, a fruit fly, a frog, and a human, even when we argue, and this is important, that discoveries about a roundworm, a fruit fly, a frog, a mouse, or a chimp have relevance to the human condition. We have made a bold and direct statement about homology. So homology is really, really important, not only if you want to sort of understand how you can generalize insights from your particular organism to others, but also when you want to justify uh, why you're doing biology in the first place. And, and, and uh, on top of that, it is one way of looking at sort of the evolution of character traits. And we've already encountered Gunter Wagner's sort of view on this, uh, which is a very powerful view. So we're gonna revisit this view in this lecture. But let, let me remind you first, what is homology? And why is it such a huge topic uh, and a difficult topic especially? And let's go back to Richard Owen's original um, definition of the term, which is the same organ in different animals under every variety of form and function. I said before this is a perfectly precise definition and it leaves all kinds of questions open. And one of the main questions is how do you identify a homologue if it can have every variety of form and function? This is a real problem. And so uh, in over history people have, have sort of debated it you know, a lot about what homology is, and there's some rather conservative views. It's very complicated. You know, homology means different things at different levels and all that. Um, so here is Gavin De Beer uh, in 1971 in his book, Homology, An Unresolved Problem. He writes, morphological structure is the only appropriate thing to be homologized. Okay, so we have to be careful. So in Owen's original spirit, it is an organ, something real, a trait, um, uh, a part of the anatomy that is being homologized. But of course, Around the same time he wrote this, the late 1960s, people discovered the homology of genes, which is both really powerful and, and somewhat misleading because in the case of uh, gene sequences, it's particularly easy to define homology as simply the degree of similarity between the sequences, okay? You can't do that at a morphological level. Every variety of form and function, remember? So similarity, isn't a good criterion for homology there. But here you have every base pair, which is basically an independent character. So overall, if you average over all this, um, uh, homology basically amounts to similarity and it's easy to measure it. Also, um, different sort of types of homology, the problem between serial homology and general homology is uh, sort of uh, repeated here uh, at this level. Uh, where you have gene duplications, you can see that you can define orthologi uh, orthologous and paralogous genes. So if a gene duplication occurs in a species, you get two copies of the genes, gene A and gene B, which are parallax, okay? They occur in the same organism, while uh, the sort of equivalent genes in other organisms are orthologs. Um, of course, this is equivalent to the problem. Parallax are sort of serial homologs at the genetic level. So a lot of the sort of issues that were connected to homology at the morphological level were easy to resolve at the genetic level. So we have homology at the, the morphological level, homology at the genetic level. And now the main problem, as you can imagine, 
is that they're not always easy uh, to bring together. And one problem is it is very complicated. We've come across this time and time again here in this course. It is very uh, difficult to, to correlate you know, evolution at the genetic and uh, the phenotypic level and to explain it mechanistically. And especially for homology at the level of gene regulatory network, networks is really problematic. And these are two papers here um, with first authored by Ahab Abu Haif in the 1990s already that discussed this sort of problem. So basically he has a huge table. I'm only showing you one of two pages here that um, lists different sort of combinations of homologies, H here, and convergences at different levels. Um, so for example, here he looks at the level of the genes, gene interactions, the gene, the, the, the whole uh, sort of network, the organization of the network, the structure of the network, embryonic origins, uh, morphological structure, and so on and so forth. And he shows all these kind of different combinations. So it's very confusing. There is a large sort of dissociability between these different levels here. Two examples, recruitment. This example here, they come from down here, uh, recruitment of a novel regulatory interaction into an ancestral network and recruitment of this network to function in convergent embryonic and morphological structures. I'm not going to go through all of this. Just be you know, aware that there's a ton of different combinations. And he introduces this idea of partial homology. It's sort of part of the network. The components and their interactions can be homologous, but not all of it. And it just, it's a big headache, okay? So because, I mean, this is happening, of course, because we have a very widespread developmental system drift. Often you get different processes, a completely different type of network that, that generates a clearly homologous morphological character. And that's one problem. The opposite of that problem, by the way, also occurs. We can call it deep homology. There's a bit of controversy whether this is really something special. But uh, here's an example of different eye types in different groups of animals. And the underlying cell types are easy to trace. Okay, you, ha you have this sort of precursor, um, the photoreceptor precursor that it is, is sort of uh, the basis of, of a cnidarian um, uh, uh, sort of light sense organ here. And then different specializations and these different photoreceptor cells make non-homologous eyes. So the structures of these eyes are very, very different. Their um, evolutionary origin is not the same, but the underlying cell types are conserved. So if something at the lower level is conserved, but the overall organ is not, this is called deep homology. So different trait with the same process. And of course, there are sort of examples of a lot of developmental um, regulators and, and um, signaling pathways. The genetic toolkit implies that a lot of the processes that, that generate non-homologous organs are uh, homologous. Okay, so there's a dissociation uh, both ways. Okay, and this makes the assessment of homology and the identification of homologs very difficult. So um, to clarify, to help with this issue, uh, Gunter Wagner in 1989 introduced uh, this sort of concept of developmental homology. So the, the, the sort of traditional um, evolutionary biology concept of homology was, is, is now called the historical concept of homology. And, and here's Ernst Meyer defining it as a feature in two or more taxa is homologous when it is derived from the same or a corresponding feature of their common ancestor. This is great, okay? So it's very precise and, and you know, we can agree to this. There are different ways of, of, of doing it. So for example, here in these different insects, you have a pair of fore wings, a pair of hind wings, I've been over this, and they are homologous despite every variety of form and function. So the hind wings of the butterfly, which are used for flying, are um, uh, homologous to the hind wings of the uh, uh, mitch here that is, you know, that are used for, for balancing and the fore wings of the butterfly used for flying are homologous to these elytra or covers, mechanical covers, protections for the wings, flying wings in, in uh, beetles, okay? So the problem, of course, is how do I know this? You know, how do I know that fore wings and hind wings are homologous? The problem is that we have to have some sort of way of tracing um, a, a feature because we cannot relive this sort of history of, you know, back to the common ancestor. We have to infer it. Okay, so this distinction between the historical concept of homology and the developmental or biological concept of homology is not sort of a different definition. The point is not to redefine the concept of homology, but the, the, the idea of the developmental or biological concept of homology is give, to give you criteria uh, 
to trace homologs, so you can infer historical homology. Okay, so these are different. They do different kind of work. These different concepts. So the the idea of developmental uh, homology, we've seen it uh, when we talked about theory in Evo Devo, is uh, that homologies are reflections of shared developmental processes. And the advantage of this type of homology, of course, is that you can also deal with serial homologs that are not going back to a common ancestor. Um, uh, necessarily. So it, it, it explains why special and serial homologs are the same thing, okay? And then um, relies on, on, on the conservation of developmental processes. Okay, so, so uh, we need to have some sort of criteria that allow us to, to identify this, to trace it. And, and of course, um, Gunter Wagner's uh, idea is this, this genetic theory of homology is that you get, um, you can identify these sort of Chin's character identity networks that underlie um, character identity of homologous traits. And um, so uh, I criticize this, this view a little bit for being too uh, much focused at the genetic level. So clearly, if we talk about underlying developmental processes, we need to generalize this principle, okay? We can't just look at uh, uh, gene networks because um, as I was arguing before, um, in an earlier module, this, this, there is not necessarily a correspondence between a specific chin network and a character trait. And also some of the traits will have uh, mechanisms that work at different levels. Let's have an example of this, okay? Let's look at the fin to limb transition. Um, and what you see here is sort of a, a fish, a uh, lobe finned fish, and then uh, and, 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 uh, tetrapod vertebrate in, in between we have this beautiful, uh, missing link fossil here, tectalic, like uh, described, that has been described as the fish that can do push-ups. And you have a series um, of, of, of fossil forms of these different um, uh, bone structures. But the problem is still uh, how to homologize different structures in very far, uh, you know, distant uh, animal taxa. For example, and there has been a big debate about the distal elements of the limb. If you compare bony fish, teleosts here in the tree, with modern tetrapods down here, you can see that they have completely different sort of structures of the limb. So the, the typical tetrapod limb has a stylopodium, sort of the upper upper arm, upper leg, thigh, or, um, uh, and and uh, the pseudopodium, which is like the lower arm, the, your calf, and, and all that, and then the autopod, which is sort of your foot and your hand, and the the distal sort of elements of, of bony fish are completely different. They're, they're uh, convergently evolved. They're, uh, these fin rays are not homologous to your autopod. And so that has led people to believe that the autopod, the hand and the foot is a uh, novelty um, that came up during the evolution uh, of tetrapods. Now, if you go further down the tree and look at the outgroup of both of these species, the chondrichthyes, the, the cartilaginous fish, um, here's a, uh, but they're also called elasmobranchs that include sharks, rays, and skates, uh, but not chimera. So basically you have uh, different elements here. So you have the sort of anterior uh, protopterygium, uh, mesopterygium, and then metapterygium. And you can show that the, uh, uh, these two different structures, they derive from different structures here, okay? So, uh, and this is, you know, from, from uh, different uh, proximal structures you get then different distal structures in evolution. Now, the, the, the thing is that even in the shark, um, there is, you know, th there are sort of conserved structures. One sort of a very basic idea in, in limb development in vertebrates is that uh, the limb is patterned through this sort of French flag mechanism uh, that starts with a, a signaling center called the zone of polarizing activity which is a source of the sonic hedgehog morphogen, um, which diffuses over the, the limb from uh, the posterior end of the limb bud. And depending on the concentration of sonic hedgehog, you get the identity of different sort of uh, distal uh, digits. Um, and this sort of uh, mechanism is very uh, conserved, but it's also sort of um, a bit more complicated, the situation. So what we want to do here is we want to trace, okay? So it's all about traceability. We want to trace the evolution of this uh, developmental process that uh, underlies 
uh, patterning of the limb in both fins and limbs and see if we can learn something about the homology of the resulting structures. Okay. And so uh, the way um, so the way you do this is you first have to take a model organism and really carefully study the process in that organism. It turns out that the limb development is actually a bit more complicated than just the French flag, if, as it usually is. So um, for a long time, there were these two sort of differing views of how digits are formed uh, in, in the tetrapod limb. Of course, um, so one was this classical view that I just showed you. It's a hedgehog as a, a morphogen gradient and the French flag interpretation of that. Uh, and another was based on a Turing sort of patterning system, we've encountered that already, where uh, you get these sort of evenly spaced stripes that will form the bony structures of the hand later on, okay? What it turns out to be is sort of both, okay? So what I'm showing you here very briefly is a, a, a movie of a simulation from James Sharp's lab uh, in Barcelona, where you can see how the limb is growing and you get the sort of formation of the, the digits here. And what's important here is that you have a sort of a, a, an underlying uh, Turing-like stripe generator that is coupled to this gradient of FGF signaling here in green. So it's basically, if you look at this, this uh, patterning process, it's a combination of a uh, French flag and a Turing patterning system. So these two views are not, um, it's another false dichotomy. They are not mutually exclusive, but they interact in this case. You have the FGF gradient, which is modulating the sort of um, uh, spacing of the stripes, which you need because the limb bud is growing outward and you need a proper sort of arrangement of these stripes. They need, your, your fingers need to be straight, not crooked. Okay, so this is what the gradient is basically doing. It's modulating um, uh, the, the wavelength of this Turing pattern during growth, so you get a properly spaced and arranged uh, uh, stripe pattern that is then um, the, the pre-pattern, the molecular pre-pattern for, for bone formation in this process. So beautiful, beautiful work, model organism in chicken and in mice. And so you can now use this to sort of go back in time and look at this old question of the distal sort of um, patterns of, of, of uh, sharks. Here's a, a dogfish or a cat shark, confusingly, uh, in Britain. And it's, it's sort of distal limb patterns that look very much unlike anything you see in a tetrapod. So by just looking at the morphology, you know, every variation of form and function, these things, uh, they don't do the same they don't have the same function. They don't have the same form. You have a bunch of intermediate forms, but they don't, don't really tell you anything. Okay, so, so just from looking at the structure, you would say they're not homologous. But if you look at the underlying process, um, you can see that sort of the same genes are involved. So I, I should have said that when I, I showed you the mice patterning, but these stripes are, are sort of molecular pre-pattern consists of an expression pattern of a transcription factor called SOX9. And, and this transcription factor is expressed in the shark limb here. You can see and it, it looks very different. It doesn't form these sort of evenly spaced stripes, but a, a line of dots here that corresponds to these distal elements of the grown up um, shark fin. This is beautiful experimental and modeling work done by Ko Animaro and Luciano Marcon uh, in the group of Chain Sharp. Um, very patient Ko very patient uh, and, and careful experimentation. So these, these limbs in sharks, they grow of over a whole month. I mean, very, very difficult experiments to do. Beautiful work. So what they did is they traced the whole growth process in, the, in dogfish and uh, made a model of it and compared it to the model in mouse. And what you can see is that here you have a comparison again of these SOX9 uh, expression patterns in the different uh, limb buds, and they took the same patterning generator, the sort of Turing system that's coupled with a gradient. Um, so there are two signaling pathways, BMP signaling and wind signaling, and they interact through this transcription factor, forming a Turing system that forms, if you run them in these different morphological contexts, the, the, the corresponding uh, sort of patterns. So a, a stripe of dots in the shark and uh, these beautiful stripes, this pre-pattern for the digits in the mouse. So the way it works is quite different, especially the way in which the, the sort of um, morphogen patterning interacts with uh, the, the uh, Turing pattern uh, system 
in mice, we said already, so that the, the gradient modulates the wavelength of the stripes while in the dog uh, fish here, it limits the expression of the Turing system in the first place. So Turing, uh, the, the, the parameter space in which these stripes form is much more limited. So you only get uh, these dot-like patterns here instead of continuous stripe-like patterns here. So this was amazing and led to a complete reassessment of homology here. So the process of generating distal limb elements seems to be conserved uh, you know, between dogfish and, and mice, although it's really difficult to see any sort of homologous structure in those distal structures. So is this deep homology? That's the conclusion of the author. I mean, there's a morphological structure that's not homologous, but it's created by the same uh, process, or, or is it simply homology? So are, should we consider those, those traits now homologous or not? Well, what it tells you is that the um, distal elements of the tetrapod limb, you know, the hand, are not necessarily a novelty, okay? So they are based on the modulation of a pre-existing process that made distal elements in the shark. And so the origin of these autopods, uh, tetrapod autopods become much less mysterious than before, okay? Here's a very important remark. The mechanism here is not a gene regulatory network, okay? So this model is at the level of interacting signaling centers, BMP and wind signaling. It's not uh, formulated in a molecularly detailed manner. And although there's a transcription factor involved, it's sort of more the target uh, output, it modulates the, the signaling um, activities. But what's important is the spatial interaction of the FGF uh, also with that sort of Turing patterning system. So mainly, the, the mechanism underlying homology here, character identity, is not a gene network, but a, a mechanism at the level of, of signa interacting um, signaling molecule. And so maybe, just maybe, we'll see uh, a publication coming forth that generalizes this idea of a, a character identity network to this idea uh, of a character identity mechanism that's much more general and applies to different level of organization. Um, so I hope this will be in print soon. Okay, enough said about that. So what I wanna focus on is, are the developmental processes themselves homologous? Okay, so what criteria do we need to define a, a, a sort of a homology of the processes, a process uh, homology? Okay, that's a sort of a, a question because it's the, the dynamics of the process are, are dis dissociable from the homology of the um, uh, resulting uh, character trait. This is a question that needs to be looked at separately, okay? And a starting point for such an account of process homology would be um, uh, what we, you know, the realization that what we see here in action is a dynamical module and at the same time a morphogenetic field, okay? So this Turing patterning system is a dynamical module that's used in different contexts. And I didn't tell you that bit in the last lecture, but um, in, in the context of developmental biology, dynamical modules, of course, are equivalent to morphogenetic fields. There can be dynamical modules that are not morphogenetic fields, like cell cycle uh, modules, but um, in this case, it is a morphogenetic field. So basically, we want to establish the homology or not of morphogenetic fields. Now, this is a complicated um, sort of uh, endeavor because it's really, it's, it's hard to identify and characterize processes compared to the identification and characterizations of morphological traits or genes. And so here's a beautiful paper from 2001 by Scott Gilbert and Jessica Bolker, both looking very happy about their achievement here, um, uh, where they introduce this idea of process homology. They say, we now use the term process homology or more formally homology of process to describe the relationship between pathways that are composed of homologous proteins and that are related by common ancestry. Those homologous pathways need not form anatomical homologs. So this is what we have here. The same sort of constituents, components in the process are, uh, you know, lead to a structure that's not necessarily an anatomical homolog. You can debate that, okay? But, you know, from, from anatomical criteria, you wouldn't say so. Furthermore, they say further extension of the concept of homology to include developmental processes will illuminate the relationships between different ontogenies. Ultimately, it is ontogenies, not individual organisms of their genes that evolve. What they're saying here is that if in order to have a truly, you know, 
sort of a mechanistic, a causal insight into the, these lineages. We need these lineage explanations, right? Um, to compare, or even a cross lineage explanation to compare uh, traits between lineages. And this will only get, if we understand the developmental process by which a, a, a trait is made, because it is, evolution is working on that. That's the causal completeness principle. Evolution is working on that onto uh, genetic uh, uh, process, okay? So this is great, but so the criterion they use, um, which we saw in the first quote, is sort of, you know, conserved components of the pathway. Okay, so I would call this pathway homology. And we were lucky with this example of the shark and fin to limb transition in the mouse. Uh, in this case, the, the components seem to be highly conserved. So there was no developmental system. To it. This is deep homology, as the authors concluded. So, um, what Gilbert and Bulker write is the structure and expression patterns of one set of genes may not indicate homology, but the coordinated assembly of several genes and gene products into a functional module and the sharing of such modules between species or between tissues of an organism is more significant. Such shared modules embody homology as a process. This is great. Okay. So the concept of homology of process is very sound, but the criterion, let's think about this. So here we were lucky in the fin to limb transition because the components were conserved. But what happens in systems where you have developmental system drift? The system drift paper, the first one, came out in the same year. So they did not know about this very widespread phenomenon. Yet. So, but in the last 20 years, we've come to know that it happens in a lot of different processes. So we need to deal with it. And we need to have a sort of a, a, an extended version of process homology if we want to apply it in cases where system drift has happened, where components of the processes have been uh, exchanged and uh, where this definition of pathway homology, as I renamed it now, no longer applies. Okay, so we want a broader sort of um, account of homology. But there's a problem, okay? So one problem is that um, we should not use the function of a process. What does it do? What is it for? Okay, I, apparently we shouldn't use it because there's a very old debate about what is called functional homology. So remember Owen's uh, definition, it says the same homology is the same organ in different animals under every variety of form and function. So similarity of function at the morphological level should not be a criterion of homology, right? But at the genetic level, we saw that similarity of sequences is the main criterion for homology because you have all these, every base pair is an independent character. And that just gives you a lot of confidence to say that if, if two sequences are similar, they're also homologous, because it's very unlikely that there's convergent evolution in this case. The problem is that a lot of molecular biologists who only know genetic homology then extrapolate that idea of similarity and talk about functional homology uh, uh, of you know, protein function and stuff like that, which is terrible, okay? So we need to be really, really careful with this because of this definition and this problem that you know, the function of homologs can differ. And what we need is a refined sort of thinking about what biology, uh, biological function is. So uh, Alan Love, a beautiful paper in 2007, has proposed what he calls a legitimate account of functional homology, because that's important. Okay, so once again, the similarity of function is not a good criterion for homology. Okay, but in some circumstances, like uh, when we have a functional innovation in evolution, we need the idea of functional non-homology, because these innovations are defined very much you know, in this paper by Gunter Wagner and Gerd Müller from 1991, innovation is defined as a functional novelty, okay? So we need something, a function that has no homologue. And also, if we want to sort of study the, the, the homology of behaviors, for example, another context in which is important, um, behaviors have a function. So we, we have to talk about uh, functional homology in some way. And what's really important here uh, so we need a legitimate account of the homology of function. So what's really important here is that we distinguish two types of function in biology, what um, Alan calls use function and activity function. So use function is the sort of thing you get when you ask, what is it for? Okay, so this is the, the gene for the, the problem, right? I mean, the gene codes, you know, for behavior, whatever. Genes code for proteins, nothing else. But uh, when they work in a sort of a context of a developmental process, they have a causal role that contributes towards the outcome of that process, which may well be a trait, a morphological trait. So that's sort of use function. Or 
wings are for flying. Okay, the function of the wing is for flying. That's a use function as well. Was it, what is it for? So, so these sort of ideological functions from selection, they are also use functions. But then there's another kind of function, and that's activity, activity function. What does it actually do? So for, for transcription factors, that, that function is what kind of genes does it regulate? Okay, so the same activity function can have different use functions in different contexts, okay? For example, the same transcription factor, the same biochemical function, activity function, can have very different effects in different developmental processes. Now imagine a pleiotropic gene, it contributes to different um, uh, traits, and it does this in a very different way, although its biochemical activity is exactly the same. So its biochemical activity is its use, uh, its, sorry, <laughs> activity function and its role, the role, the causal role it plays in each one of those uh, processes is its use function. This distinction between biochemical function and developmental function uh, was already made in, in Ahab uh, Abu Hayf's paper in 1997, by the way. So we can redefine homology here in this context as the same activity function under every variation of form and use function, okay? And so uh, this has immediate importance for, for the idea of process homology, of course, um, because we can look at processes as a sort of actions, you know, they, they activities, what happens, uh, and distinguish that from uh, their functional outcome. What do they produce and why does that happen? Why are they, they there in the first place, okay? So we can apply this sort of legitimate account of functional homology, the same activity function under every variation of form and use function, um, to come up with an account of process homology that's more general than that of Gilbert and Balker, and it's based on homology of activities. And this is work I'm currently doing. We're writing a paper uh, with James uh, DeFrisco. Just a very brief overview before I wrap up and stop what this is based on. So what we do is we distinguish simple versus complex activities. Um, Simple activities are, for example, you know, the activity of a molecule, the direct biochemical sort of activity is tied. So structure there is tied to function, okay? Because if you don't have that chemi chemical component, it's not gonna do anything, okay? And complex activities, which come out uh, of more uh, uh, of mechanisms where you have different interactions and the activity of the mechanism, um, it's, its activity is defined by the organization of the interactions uh, among components. We've been over that when we talked about mechanistic explanation. Okay, so what we're looking at here are complex activities because only those can have a sort of a, a degree of dissociability from the underlying components because of network drift. It, it's only possible if you have an activity of a network, not just the activity of a single uh, gene or gene product, for example, which is a simple activity, very much tied to its substrate. So we need to be able, we need to have some sort of account to individuate and identify um, processes based on their activities. So uh, only processes that can be individuated can be homologized. So very general processes like growth, tissue growth is not homologous, although it happens in all kinds of um, um, uh, animals. It happens based on very different sort of uh, uh, underlying uh, processes are, are, you know, it's not useful to talk, even if it, the underlying um, uh, pathways are conserved in very many cases, it's not very useful to talk about homology of this because it's just too general. Okay, so we need to individuate processes to homologize them. Individual process, individuated processes are dynamical models. Ta-da! And in the context of developmental biology, they are morphogenetic fields. So that's the basis for a homology of activity. Um, and, and those represent dissociable levels of organization. I'm going to give you an example. So you may have heard this before, but um, the last sort of point we make in the paper is that an account of homology uh, of activities requires dynamical modeling because you need um, uh, those dynamical models to uh, characterize these individuated processes and uh, characterize the type of activity they're performing. That is done through dynamic mechanistic explanation. Okay, so an example, vertebrate somitogenesis is a beautiful process. Here you see uh, part of a mouse embryo and this you, along the body axis, here's the it's neurolating, here's the uh, neural tube and, and you have these somites that form one by one uh, as the tissue in the posterior grows and this uh, process involves 
this beautiful sort of uh, regulatory dynamics that you see here uh, with these traveling waves of gene expression through the tissue and then these stripes that form one by one that correspond uh, to a molecular pre-pattern of a, a forming solenoids here. So uh, this uh, is, is a beautiful, beautiful process that um, has been extensively analyzed. And so the bottom line is that this process is governed by three different, a, a sort of a three-tiered um, mechanism where the bottom tier is a sort of an autonomous uh, oscillation of gene expression in single cells of the tissue, which is regulated by feedback between um, uh, genes of the Hess family of, of transcription factors that regulate, that inhibit their own uh, transcription. And then you have a sort of a second layer at, or tier, a synchronization of these oscillations across the tissue, um, where, uh, which involves the notch signaling pathway. And then you have a, an upper tier where you have a global control of the oscillations and the sort of the progression of these waves through the tissue. So this, this is a classical example of three different dynamical modules. You can take the, the um, process apart. And here you also see that different levels of organization in this mechanism don't necessarily have to um, represent different spatial scales, OK? So it's an it's a organizational hierarchy, not a spatial hierarchy necessarily, uh, that interacts here. And so what is important here is these three tiers of the model correspond to different dynamical modules at different levels of organization. That's what I just said. But also that it's, it's important to note that the activities of these dynamical modules are strongly conserved across all vertebrates, but not necessarily their interacting components. There was a very surprising study that came out in 2011 where people did a comparative study uh, between chicken, uh, mouse, and zebrafish. And what they did is they uh, identified they did a screen for all the oscillating um, uh, genes in this particular part of the tissue. This is a schematic representation of this embryo, and you can see here's the posterior, it's the pre-submitting mesoderm, and here are the forming somites up here. Down here uh, is, is the node or, or the organizer where this all uh, starts, and you can see uh, uh, different, so what difference between the species is, is not the general principles involved in this pattern informing process, but sort of the time scales. Okay, so a, a zebrafish forms uh, a, zomite, a zomite within 30 minutes and, and takes several hours in, in uh, mice and chicken. So uh, what they found by doing a screen where they tried to identify all uh, the oscillating genes in this tissue is really surprising. So here it's the resulting Venn diagram. So they had um, uh, over 100 genes in a chicken embryo, uh, 56 um, uh, genes in mice, 24 in zebrafish, and look at the uh, overlap, two genes, both of them, these Hess factors that are at the very heart of the, the mechanism. That's this, this first tier of the mechanism that basically induces the oscillation in the first place. There is no conservation otherwise. These organisms do not share any molecular components between each other. And yet there is no doubt that the process is homolog homologous because the activities, uh, the activity function of these three different dynamical modules is conserved. They do exactly the same thing in those different animals. So here is where this, this sort of uh, new account of uh, process homology in terms of activities is very important because you couldn't identify components here, like Gilbert and Volker suggest in this system. And yet there is no doubt that this process of somatogenesis is conserved. Okay, so, so this is basically where we're at right now. So what I've been trying to give you uh, over the last few modules is, is this sort of, you know, perspectival view on evolution, that you can have all these different perspectives. And in particular, in this module, of course, we've been um, focusing on process perspectives that are sort of based on a tradition of uh, structural, uh, process structuralism. This is where I come from, but are trying to generalize it away from this sort of fixed idea of, of fixed rules and fixed models, going in in a pragmatic way using uh, dynamic mechanistic explanation, using dynamical modeling of, of particular systems to come up with ideas um, explanations, mechanistic explanations in the dynamic mechanistic sense of, of phenomena like uh, developmental system drift we talked about 
how this works in the gap genes, uh, we've talked about modularity, dynamic modularity, and today we talked about how you use this, both of the previous sort of phenomena to explain the homology of process. So there's lots to be done and lots of exciting work uh, to be contributed that moves away from this sort of, it's, it's, it's rigorously grounded in a, in a mechanistic account of, of uh, evolutionary process. And uh, it's beautiful. There is a lot to be done, a lot of new work to be done, a lot of new insight to be gained. So we have lots and lots of stuff to do, okay, if we know what we want to do, to ask new questions and to actually bring uh, the, the field forward instead of, of keeping on uh, discussing, you know, having these verbal descriptions of different ways of, of, of describing um, uh, facilitated variation, you know, um, epigenetic innovation, uh, you know, reciprocal causation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That doesn't bring us forward. These sort of very specific and grounded approaches will bring the field forward and also show the limitations of what we have here because we will hit these limitations. We, we looked at this agential perspective and the fu uh, fu fundamental sort of uh, uh, agential um, nature of organisms and, and even James Grissomer's uh, reproducer perspective, remember, told us that um, we sort of get into these problems as soon as we have a closed life cycle. We have an, an, an organism with agency. So the next thing is to ask what does this agency do to evolution? So in the very last module, there will only be two lectures. One will be about this new science of agency, agential evolution. It, it is radical. We can't do it yet. We don't have the tools. So we need to first philosophically discuss what would this science look like? So let's do that in the next lecture. And then the very last lecture, I want to talk about what is the kind of scientific academic environment that allows this. At the moment, it's very difficult to do this kind of stuff. It's not being funded, it's not getting any attention. And it's very hard to discuss the real issues because of all these fake dichotomies and these discussions like the extended synthesis uh, that are about the wrong problems, in my opinion. Okay, so let, let's look at that in the last module uh, where hopefully everything that we've talked about will come together in some sort of coherent account of evolution in perspective. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you tune in again next time. Bye.